Yes, I know I'm late, but it's not my fault. It's Ash's fault. I'm going to give him shit. Woke me up 3 o'clock in the morning. Good to sleep well. Gives me anxiety. <laughs> Creating urgency. Guys, have some mercy on me. Check out your time. See how late it is. Don't make it urgent. I've got videos for you guys. Watch that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> We're here now. Let's see. What's going on? We have... We have you. <clears throat> Jack is here. Hello, Jack. Hatter says, Mail 17 UK. Hi, Miran. Hope your day is going well. I have something that worries me. And it is the fact that I have always been sexually attracted to women, but never felt those butterflies in my stomach. This scares me and I do not know what to do. Why should this scare you? Why are you guys constantly looking for um, evidence that um, you have two eyes, or you have a nose, or you can breathe. What do you want evidence for? It's like you don't believe your own existence, and you're constantly looking for evidence for somebody, something, to tell you who you are. <laughs> you are you. You know who you are. You know what you like. You don't have to be scared or worried about anything, because you have nothing to prove. No answer you should be seeking for anything. Live your lives. Live your lives. You're the boss. No thought, no feeling, no bullshit can change you or make you worry about what you are, what you like. You don't need evidence for every fucking thing that you want to do. Oh, I farted right now. Oh, that might mean that I am not really thinking well maybe maybe my existence is not as perfect as i thought it is because i farted right now i mean you guys creating so much anxiety for yourselves and the main reason for that is this one of the main reasons for anxiety and every other mental problems that we have pretty much is the fact that we do not live by observation, by observing, going through life by observing. We go through life by stories that are nonsense. We go through life by perceiving everything that we are observing. The key is to observe and not interpret, not follow the meaning of the word that is describing what you're observing. Just observe. A bird is flying in the air. I can see that. That's all. I am one with life. Everything is balanced. But the moment that I say, oh, that looks like a jet aircraft. Whoa. Now jet, the word jet has engines and how fast is it going? It can be bombing someplace or it has a mission. And the worldwide, there were lots of jets and this and that. So for now, suddenly, all these perceptions and descriptions and stories of something you saw, and that should have been it. I saw the tree. Beautiful. Me and the tree are one. I am the observed. But the minute I give a name to the tree, 
And then I go in this, what species it is, what kind of fruit it has or doesn't, what sits on it, where it is. All of that now creates all things that takes me away from the present moment. And then it starts with meanings of the words and the conclusions of the meanings of the words and the stories that the words are connected and association of these things. And I'm going somewhere else, totally different, out of the moment, no longer living by observing. And created the stories that I'm looking for, answer to those stories, which they never even existed. I created them. I allowed the brain to create them. And I'm following that tangent. That's the problem with anxiety. It creates anxiety. And all these questions that you guys have, you want to solve and you think you got to solve, there's an answer to be had. None of that is true. None of that is true. You need to be able to live by observing life. Hmm? Instinct. Like when we had no ability to think or speak, everything was clear. Because there was no interference of thoughts which has images and suggestions and words and the words have meanings and association to other words and the stories come up and comparisons and perceptions of what it is we're way out of connection with what it is and that's all it's needed for our life i'm not talking about when we need to make judgments about certain pathway we take or not certain road or certain things we want to buy that's not what i'm talking about you know what i'm talking about I'm talking about you allowing your brain to actually transcribe or describe or write a scenario for what it is that you're seeing, doing, observing, being, are. Nothing is you anymore. You allowed some brain to hijack your life. Hmm? Instead of you being the boss of the brain, you've allowed the brain to be the boss of you. That's the whole problem. Watch my video, Are You or the Brain is the You? And the one that I just uploaded today, this morning, will help you out very much. The rest of it, you're guilty of allowing this to be done to you by your brain. Get a hold of that. Come back to balance. Observe life. Like you cannot think, you cannot speak. Like when you were an animal living instinctively. Run, hunt, sleep, have sex. Everything clear. No thoughts, no confusions, no descriptions, no, uh, you know, uh, perception. Nothing. Just be. There is no doubt in being. It's the brain that creates the doubts and bullshits. And you have been duped to think that the brain is your intellect. You're going to follow what it says. No. Brain is one of the dumbest places in your life. In your entity. Dumbest organ. Why? Because it thinks it knows stuff. And it always strays you wrong. Hmm? How many mistakes in life have you had? That brain was not involved. Thoughts was not involved. All mistakes and all disasters was because thoughts were involved. Take that away, live your life, the present moment, balanced, don't look for answers from the idiot brain, look for answers nowhere, because you are who you are, all answers have been already given when you were born. Now you're trying to listen to your brain that causes, uh, you know, uh, distractions and causes confusions and causes uh, conflicts discrepancies you know that's the problem you got to put the brain in its place it's like uh, you're a CEO of a company of a corporation and you've been running the corporation perfectly well and now every morning you come to work the night watchman says oh did you do this and you're taking your orders from the night watchman and trying to please and listen to his suggestions and constantly you're confused and the whole thing is falling apart. And you're thinking the night watchman is the wisdom, is the one you should follow. Until it comes to your attention, the whole board gets together and says, well, what are you doing? So well, I'm doing what he says, but why? He's a night watchman. 
He knows nothing. Here, let me take his tag off. You have put the tags wrong. You've put the tag to him as a, I don't know, intelligence of the, I don't know, company, the expert of certain, you know, marketing or whatever it is. Take the tag off. You're seeing it wrong. It's a night watchman. Doesn't know shit. He's just trying to keep everything secure and worries about everything. And you shouldn't allow the worriness and worrisome of the night watchman to get into your face and make you do things and be concerned about things that are not a concern. He's crazy. That's his job, to worry about things. And that's what the brain's job, amygdala is, constantly worry about things, you know? Thalamus gives the information of anxieties and dangers that it seems to be danger to amygdala, and amygdala doesn't consult with prefrontal cortex with you and just does what it does and gets everything heightened and everything is going to respond as if it's, there is a danger. And you're following that because you feel the danger. And because you feel the danger, you think what was said, what was suggested could be correct. That's not it. Amygdala is crazy. It's reacting to things and you feel the reaction because it, it mobilizes all the responses in the body, all kinds of responses. And then you feel those responses and then you think those are the evidence for the truthfulness of that bullshit that appeared as a suggestion or an image or thought. You gotta understand all these things and you'll be fine. Separation between brain, thoughts, and you will set you free. You're the boss, the rest are below you. You're not supposed to listen to your brain. Hmm? You're supposed to follow what it is that you are and you know you are. And every time that you argue with the brain, that tells you the brain is wrong. Because if there was right, there was no argument. Because you argue, that means you're right, the brain is wrong. That's the end of it. That's the end of it. Go on that. And now let's see what we have here. Just hang on, guys. I gotta get my tea. All right. Hello, Aman. Hello, Ash. How to say someone removed my comment? Oh, I didn't do that. The only person is can do that is Ash. So ask him if he has done it. Ash says, just dropping by to say I'm on a train right now on my way to <laughs> getting late. Uh, no, I'm not here to brag, people with HOCD, I had HOCD for three years, I was convinced I would become gay, I was terrified. And that's it. Ash says, my advice to everyone here with HOCD is to just go and do whatever the fuck you want in spite of what your brain is telling you. Good for you. And Ash says, 
hope you have a great session. Yeah, God damn it, I will. If you would have let me sleep. <laughs> you will have the ugly stick, uh, you know, be emailed to you for sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ash is, <laughs> says I'm, I'm his hitman. You hit yourself, goddammit, for your insolence last night. <laughs> All right, let's see what's going on. Nina, it says, hi, Miran, female 16. SK, what was that? What? Um, I forgot, what was it? South Africa, no. Um, Slovakia? Anyhow. I don't remember. <laughs> Andrea says, hello, Mehran, female 18, Czech Republic, Central Europe. Yes, I have two questions. One, can a heterosexual think someone of the same sex is attractive? Yes, of course, we should. We always are capable of seeing anything attractive in life. Horses, dogs, handbags, cars, you know, people. Young, old, well-dressed, not well-dressed, nice hair, nice look, nice eyes, nice nose, a fit body. It's within our capabilities. It's perfectly normal to notice uh, someone of the same uh, gender, good looks, or well-presented and whatnot. It's perfectly normal. Uh, it's just the way it should be. Look at the James Bond movies, Sean Connery, dashing, gentleman, good looks, well-dressed. That's a role model of a man. So we as young kids, when we were much younger, we would look and learn and admire. See how he's combed his hair, how good looking he is, where girls like him. This is how we should be behaving and this and that so forth. So. It's perfectly normal to, that's the first thing we notice because we are concerned about our own looks, our own presentation, if the girls like us, if we are presentable, if we look good because it gives us confidence, gives us certain kind of respect that we always try to kind of maybe impress other people by the way we handle ourselves, by the way we carry ourselves, by the way we dress, by the way we properly speak or how we look, how we comb our hair. All of these are something that makes us feel strong. So we notice that about ourselves, and we certainly notice that about everybody else. But then the brain catch on, and we say, oh, you notice that same gender? That means it's, uh, it's intersexual interest. None of that shit. That's a garbage, and the translation of the nonsense that the brain brings into the picture, which is its job to make thoughts. Whatever is possible to make thoughts, it makes thoughts. But it has no no agenda it doesn't understand what it's doing it just associates things and then spits it out you're supposed to be the filter so oh shut up yeah okay thank you but that's not you know uh, appropriate or that's not my interest that's it you're not supposed to be following what the brain starts or says or believe it all right you question everything that brain does. Just let it do what it's saying. Don't pay attention. You do what you think you do because you're the boss. It's just one of these employees that does things, you know, around the place. But you're not supposed to be listening to what it says, what it does, what it, oh, it did it this way, then that must be right. No, you're the boss. You own everything. So you don't pay attention to what the brain says, does, shows, whatever. Because brain is crazy. Brain is not an intellect. Brain is just an apparatus. It's a 
is an organ. Does this thing like your intestine, you know, takes food, turns into energy, and then gets the feces out. That's what it does. You don't question, oh, the feces, oh, it must be the real thing. No, that's a feces. You should have nothing to do with it. The energy that it did, that's what you enjoy. And the brain, it's got lots of garbage that comes out of it. You don't pay attention to that. The things that you choose that is beneficial, useful to you, that's the one that you choose. You choose. You live by your vetoes and your choices, not by suggestions and thoughts and images of the brain. Brain is not an authority. It's an organ. God damn it. Which goes haywire, actually. All right. I'm here for one hour, then I gotta go. Alexandra Ored says, hello, Mehran, how are you? Thank you, dear. Don't forget the protocol, guys and girls. Age, gender, where are you tuning in from? And she's Arand, Anand. I need the protocol, and she's age, gender, where you're tuning in from. Then I'll get to your question. Nina, stop listening to garbage. Mm -hmm. watch psychotherapists videos watch the videos that are talking scientific and talking sense like my videos you watch uh, world renowned and experts in OCD HOCD videos of psychotherapists clinical psychologists like Dr. Philipson like Dr. Jan Rayner, like Dr. Owen, like Dr. Schwartz. These are all world known. And they're on YouTube as well. So therefore, you have so many good sources instead of listening to the garbage of some people say this or say that. Who the fuck are they? What do they know? What's their uh, credentials? People don't know shit and they talk shit. Whether they have some motivations, hidden motivations, or they're just oblivious to what really OCD and subsets of OCD, including HOCD, is. I have a video called, Are You in Denial? That could also be an eye opener for you. Awaken the myth says, stuck in an apartment with my ex. How do I get over him while being in a situation where I see him every day? Yeah. See him as an entity to be observed rather than when you see him allow all the history and the moments and experiences to cover what he actually is today. Because right now, obviously things happen between you guys that you guys broke up. And when you look at him, you don't see those things as he is today. You look at him, but you perceive him as he was when you guys met 
and things were good. So that image is covering up his actuality today. You need to see him as he is, as he treats you, as he interacts with you today, not how he, he used to be and used to interact with you then. Because then there was no problem. It's all good stuff. So then you think that then is him now. But in order to be able to not confuse that and get over the person, you got to see that person the way he actually is today. Focus on that. If he's not treating you well, if you guys have discrepancies and, and disagreements and differences, that's what you should be focusing on. Not on the things that were like, you know, lovey-dovey. That's what confuses you and stops you from moving on. <clears throat> Unstoppable force B24 London. What is B? Is it standing for boy? Is it fine to focus on myself for two to three years before I start? Dating again recently got over an ex. Yeah, but I, I just don't know what B stands for. Is it boy? Is it, I don't know, Batman? <laughs> what the hell is it? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. You don't have to date right away. <laughs> You can date whenever you want. Keegan Averill says, how come even... Keegan, what about introduction? What happened to introduction, guys? Do you guys go to someone's home and just start talking? Or meet someone and start talking? You shake hands. You say, hello, my name is this and that. You're the same. What happened? Protocol. I got to know how old you are, who you are, what gender you are. So I can speak to you properly. Address you properly. Keegan, what's that info? Come on, spit it out. I want to get you a question. It's not a bad question. All right. Charles DC says, hello. Charles, protocol, age, gender, where are you tuning in from? Keegan Averill says, male, 17, Seattle. Okay, thank you. Keegan says, how come, even though I have done so much research about HOCD, I know that thoughts aren't real, and I know that I am actually straight, I still go through the process of thinking I might be in denial. Because the problem with you guys is that you guys think when you're going through OCD or HOCD, you're still balanced that all faculties work perfectly and this condition is in your face. When you have OCD, HOCD and substance of OCD, including HOCD specifically, that means there is a malfunction in the signaling system of the brain. When there's a malfunction, it doesn't let you judge and think and do the right thing. So it gets you to follow the train of thoughts, which is all bullshit. But you believe that you got to get an answer and follow the tangents and the chain link of these thoughts. Because you forget there is a malfunction. OCD, HOCD and the rest of it is called doubting disease. You doubt everything. That's the disease. So you say, even though I know I'm a straight, but why do I follow this? Because it is in that name, the doubting disease. So you doubt everything, even though you know, but you doubt. You get me? 
Do you hear the words coming out of my mouth? <laughs> Rush Hour. Rush Hour 2. <laughs> Jackie Chan and uh, Chris, what is it, Chris Tucker? So, that's the whole thing. That you are, an anxiety and a fear is created. And in order to make sure that you're okay and there's no attack or danger expecting you in the works, you follow the thought in order to try to dismantle it, to destroy it, to protect yourself. So it is kind of hard not to follow a negative thought because you're designed to protect yourself. So a suggestion of possibility of a harm or danger to your balance, to who you are, is introduced, you go at it, you go to war. What's the war here? To follow what the thought is trying to say and do, and then you try to investigate it. But because there is no, no um, answer to be had, because you're the boss, you're the decision maker, yet you're looking for answer to your knowledge from some apparatus of your entity, your brain, your intestine, your liver, you're waiting for them to give you affirmation about what you know you are. And since such thing can never happen, you constantly are in pursuit of finding something. And when you can't find it because they can't respond, because they're not intellect, they're just organs, but you expect them to respond to you as if they are intellect. And because they don't, you constantly go after it. That's why it constantly takes you. That's why Dr. Schwartz and all the psychotherapists who are specialists in this, they say, don't let this process become your habit. Because once it becomes a habit, you're no longer doing it for any other reason. Not for the obsession, not for the compulsion, not for the dopamine, not for any, you just do it because it became your habit. And that becomes more difficult to get rid of it. So the best thing to do is to ignore the bullshit. Don't look for answer. Don't debate it. Don't engage it. Don't interact with it. Just recognize for what it is intrusive thoughts OCD HOCD call it for what it is this is not me it's HOCD this is not me this is the brain this is intrusive intrusive thoughts call it for what it is and then let it fall by the wayside by ignoring it and focus on what it is that you set out to go and set out to do Whatever your interest is, you do that. Whatever your job is, whatever your project is, whatever your, whatever it is that you set out to accomplish that day, that's what you do, regardless of what thoughts shows up. When you keep doing this, the brain learns that you have no interest in these sort of trains of thoughts. And through neuroplasticity, it starts rewiring itself because you're training it. One of the missions in life is to train your brain we all forget, we think we've come with the brain that is trained. The brain is only 40,000 years old. We, millions of years before the brain was given to us the way it is, we survived, we lived. We were there before the brain was added to you. Hmm? So therefore, you need to understand that the brain has no credibility. Hmm? And it's because of its ability to think, that's why these troubles are. Because when we couldn't think, 40,000 years ago, we didn't have such a brain, everything was perfectly balanced. Instinct, no interference, no confusions, no thoughts, nothing about anything that you were not. You would run, sleep, hunt, have sex, everything was clear, hardwired, no Confusion. Why? Because there was no thoughts. If you look at the animal world, all, all the mammals, none of them have these kind of questions or dilemmas. Why? We are the only species that have these interferences, interruptions, confusions, questions, and challenges. Why? What's the difference between us and other mammals? The only or the biggest difference is we can think. They can't. So they're safe. They live instinctively. There is no interference. It's all hard wires. Their gender, 
their inclination, their needs, all hardwires without any interruption or discrepancies or confusion. But there is a confusion in us. Why? The difference is because we can think. So the problem is not that we are changing or we are in any danger of any kind. The problem is that we can think and the thought is the root of all problems. Not your biology. If you look at it, you will see there is no lioness that goes to another lioness and says, hmm, I like you. Hmm? It doesn't happen for them because they can't think. So they're acting on how they've been put together all throughout their life. We, we create confusion. You know, tangents, possibilities, that can be done. We have an incredible ability to conjure up things. That's why we can invent things. We can create things that can't even be created, but we conjure them up. We can think of things that it's impossible to even exist in the world, but we can create them in our brain. That's the ability that we have. That's why we can invent things and advance in different ways. But it also has a drawback. It creates confusions, creates nonsense in something that is not uh, relevant to you. And then it causes you to follow it because now you have also the fear of what if I am not what I am because now I have the doubt in this, I have the doubt everything. And that fear gets you go try to unlock everything and find answers and destroy all the doubts. And all that costs you the whole life of following something that has never been true. Hmm? If you were homosexual, you would have known it because that's how you've been put together in the womb of your mother and you're born that way. If you're heterosexual, you know it because that's how you've been put together in the womb of your mother and you've been born that way. The rest of your life, you're going to be that what you've been put together in the womb of your mother and how you've been created and how you've been born. It's not going to change. Hmm? So then figure out. That's where the brain comes to the picture. When it goes rogues and malfunctions, it makes you think about all these things. And then your, your program to protect yourself goes after it. And this going after it, persistence to the end of the world because you want to protect yourself. So you go try to poke in everything, every possibilities. And in that journey, you hurt yourself because you're constantly becoming anxious and worried about things that don't exist, but because your brain has gone malfunctioning and you're trying to come up with a solution, with an answer. There's no answer to be. There's nothing wrong with you. The brain has just gone a little bit wacko. So in order to fix that, you need to rewire the brain, not to believe the brain and go solve what the brain suggests or fight with that and protect yourself against that. No, it's just to fix the brain. And to do that is to ignore the garbage, recognize it for what it is, intrusive thoughts. Hmm? Call it for what it is, intrusive thoughts, OCD. Hmm? And then let it fall by the wayside because you're not interested. Hmm? And then focus on what it is that you're doing by ignoring it. No matter if they show up a million times, you ignore it a million times. And you focus on what it is that you choose. You live by your vetoes and your choices, not by suggestions, thoughts, and images of the brain. And in that way, you rewire the brain through neuroplasticity, and the brain starts learning that these are not interesting to you, and it learns. It's retrained. And it starts behaving and these thoughts will reduce and if they show up again you know what they are you won't panic and go nuts hmm? and you relax and that relaxation brings back the balance and you'll live your life happily ever after and be in touch with your psychotherapist and so on and learn from what they have to guide you to understand this better and educate yourself All right. Shatun J says, suffered uh, through HOCD for five years, now completely fine and buzzing. <laughs> Hang in there, people. 
everything will be great someday. There we go. Murray Duplis says, Mail 57, Manitoba, Canada. And thank you for that. Crypto King says, what's this channel about? Crypto, look at the title. It's about breakups, relationships, intrusive thoughts, OCD, HOCD, and things to do with thoughts, consciousness, fear, desire, ego, mechanical process, order of life, routine of life, and all these things that have to do with our psyche. So we try to learn about our psyche and how to deal with it, how to understand it, and so on. Guys, remember that um, if you wanted to discuss uh, your challenges, relationship, uh, breakups, or matters of HOCD and whatnot, uh, you can go on my site, mindthatseekstruth.com, mindthatseekstruth.com, and make an appointment on Skype. And for one hour appointment, I will add another hour for initial uh, session. And so we'll have two hours to discuss what's concerning you one-on-one -on, -one on Skype. Ross T says, Hi, Mehran. Mail 32 UK. Thank you for that. Says, Haven't been here for a while. Yeah, Ross, you've been absent. This is good to see you. Been struggling lately again with loneliness. I have OCD too, and thoughts scare me. Sometimes I get angry OCD thoughts. I have a lot of problem, including physical health too, and beginning to see that life isn't like the movies. Yeah. Just wanted to be happy and with, be happy with a woman and live a normal life. I have a lot of barriers in the, in the way. I ruined a previous relationship because of my relationship OCD and still think about her. I do try meet others but I'm losing my looks and women don't want to get to know me as much. What are you talking about losing your looks? Women hardly come to you because of your looks. Initially, maybe that may have some little bit to it. But even if you were the most good looking man on earth, after a while getting to know each other, the women may not be interested because they're not really how we are affected by them focused on their looks and that motivates us and keeps us in there as long as we can take it even though if they could be really assholes just because they look so pretty and we are programmed to follow that aesthetic beauty and sexual uh, attraction because of their looks and fitness but eventually we come to our senses and we understand that we cannot have a relationship with pretty because pretty does not equal smarts or intelligence or values or compatibility. Pretty is what we are programmed to follow, but not the ingredient that can keep a relationship together and bond us on consciousness level. Women, to begin with, they do what we do at the end. They look at you, maybe they like how you look, but even if you don't look good, which is, I'm sure it's not in your case, but the moment you open your mouth, whether you're good looking, they could lose interest, or if you're not so good looking, they could actually gain interest because of how you treat them, the energy they extend, your intentions, your being there, gives them the feeling of security. And all that is what you get to know about each other through a relationship. So to begin with, thinking about yourself in the way you just said, it's futile. It's no way of going to try to 
You know, it's like trying to go catch a fish. I'll never catch a fish. I never catch a fish. I don't have the right equipment. I don't know it. How do you know? There's so many fish there says, look, I'm hoping that someone with a bad equipment comes here and catches them because that's the only person I want to be caught by. How do you know? And, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. So don't don't defeat yourself. It's like you go into a boxing match and before you go into the ring, you know, most, uh, most uh, um, uh, sparring, uh, most, uh, what is it? Um, events, boxing events, are won and lost before the boxing begins. Pretty much. Because it has a lot to do with the mental state. I'm not going to win. Oh, I, I don't, you know. That already does it. Like you've already lost. So you think this way before you actually want to approach a woman. You don't know what she thinks, what her taste is, what she's looking for. Maybe she's exactly looking for kind of energy, you know, a, a you know, person that you are. Uh, but constantly focusing on things that are not going for you, like I have OCD, who would like that? Well, you know, first of all, work on the fucking OCD and get that shit out of your head because we all know there's some pretty bad stuff to interfere with your life. And if you watch my videos that has... Uh, described OCD in so many ways uh, uh, based on the neuroscience, based on this research of um, uh, famous uh, psychotherapists and researchers such as Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Philipson, and um, Dr. Owens, Dr. Leibet, uh, Dr. Um, Penfield, Dr. Speary, all these have had tremendous experiences and done amazing experiments, uh, um, um, Nobel Prize winning echelon experiments in the laboratories on these subjects. And they have come up with amazing finds about what OCD is and how to deal with it. So you can deal with that and get rid of it by understanding it. Watch the videos. We've got over 2,000 videos on this channel on all these things to do with the you know, function of our psyche, including maybe four or five hundred videos on uh, OCD and HOCD and substance of OCD and explanation of how the brain works and all that. So follow it up. Don't give up on yourself, for, for heaven's sake. This whole life is about you training your brain and it malfunctions, so you fix it. Don't think that, oh, the brain has gone this way, so now I go this way. Oh, brain gone this way, now I go this way. The brain gone that way, now I go that way. No! The fucking brain is an apparatus. You command it. You train it. You teach it. Not to follow it. Why am I speaking with an Irish accent? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I am international. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Keegan says, Thank you for answering. You're quite welcome. Nina, you live by your vetoes and choices. The brain is not capable of reaching you in all aspects. There are aspects of the mind, there are aspects of you that the brain cannot reach. Hence, puts the brain at way below your authority. Brain is an apparatus designed to help you for what you want to accomplish as a tool, not as the boss or defining algorithm for who you are, what you are, and I, your identity. That's not. Your identity is not the brain. Hmm? So, watch the video that I released this morning at 7 o'clock 
It says, what does brain have to do with our sexual orientation? And it's got a interesting stuff in there for you to understand, you know, how you should train your brain and how you should interpret your brain and its role and its place in your life. Don't treat it any more than what it is because then you will start following it and you don't follow your ass, do you? You don't follow your brain either. They each have their job. It's just they're on two different parts of your body. <laughs> but you treat one with <laughs> with balance, which is you know the lower part, but you don't treat this one with balance. You treat it as if it's a god, it's a deity, it's my leader, teacher. No, it's the dumbest thing that you've ever seen because it really has no understanding, mandate, or anything. It's just a machine that does what it does, which is making thoughts. But you choose them, judge them, separate them, and see if they're useful or not useful. You are the intellect, not the brain. Watch the video that I have says, are you or the brain is the you? And then you will see lots about the neuroscience uh, experiments uh, neurosur by neurosurgeons such as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Speary, Dr. Penfield, Dr. Owen, Dr. Leibet, these are all based on the presentation that Dr. Ignar did. And uh, I've made that video and it's a little bit more elaborate in some parts. So it's very interesting for you. Uh, through that video, you can get to know about your brain. Very, very interesting stuff. And when you get to Dr. Leibitz's experiment, wow, amazing. It shows you that when you actually veto a suggestion of the brain, Brain is not even involved. There's no electromagnetic activity in the brain when you actually make a choice, when you actually veto the brain's choice or brain suggestion, which means brain is not the leader. Brain cannot even reach you. You're above it all, and you should know that. All right. I will try to put... Let me see if I can put that um, video up for you so you can actually have it right here. What are you? Oh, <laughs> no wonder. I'm using a different keyboard and expecting that computer to respond. Hmm. There we are. That's the video that I want you guys to watch. It's a lengthy video, but it's a very, very interesting. As far as I'm concerned, it's very interesting. Okay, there it is. Okay. Okay. So Chuck says, 37 male, Pennsylvania. So what's up, man? I like the Irish accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got my, uh, my moments. Sometimes I find myself uh, 
having a Chinese accent, Japanese accent, Russian accent, Irish accent, and <laughs> French accent, German accent, Indian accent, <laughs> Persian accent. <laughs> I'm a radio station. I remember when I used to travel to Portland every weekend from Vancouver. It's like three hours drive and come back. You know, I had martial art trainings there and then I would come back uh, at the end of the weekend. Uh, like I would leave Friday nights and then uh, Saturday in Seattle and then move on to early morning Sunday for my training and then come back late at night. And while I was driving, I would be, you know, <laughs> being comical by having a discussion with myself with different accents. And I would be laughing my head off while driving alone. And I'm sure the cars passing by say, this guy is crazy, laughing by himself <laughs> while driving. But, uh, you know, that's me. I entertain myself. <laughs> uh, Okay. In the beginning, okay. What is uh, you say? Please help, but you have you, you don't introduce yourself. Who you are, where you are, uh, you know, nothing. I can say, it just says, I. It says please help. Then it says in the beginning, I don't have this idea. I don't know where what what. What do you mean? It says now I feel like I have forgotten, forgot this attraction, and I have not experienced in my all life any experience. Yeah, that's that's what the brain is is malfunctioning and its signaling system and is uh, throwing you off. That's what OCD and HOCD. I don't know still which one it is that you you're not saying uh, does. It throws you off, makes you think you are something else, and. None of that. None of that is true. It's just the brain's gone malfunction. As I explained before, in the basal ganglia area, in the midbrain, the striatum, there's a lever called caudate nucleus. Caudate nucleus is responsible to shut down intrusive thoughts. You know, any kind of intrusive thoughts: pedophilia, harm, responsibility, OCD homosexual OCD or sexual orientation OCD, any of these are thoughts that is not in line with your values and contrary to your orientation and your uh, what, what your values are, when they show up, because the brain makes thoughts and all kind of thoughts that it could be possible is going to be made by the brain because the brain has no intellect to know what your values are, should I make this thought or not? It just makes thoughts. That's why every human being on earth has intrusive thoughts. There is no human being that doesn't have intrusive thoughts. But when the intrusive thoughts show up, caudate nucleus's job is to shut down the intrusive thoughts because it knows what your values are. Hmm? So when something that you're not or some thought that is contrary to your values or intention of any kind shows up. You say, oh, what's that thought? And then caught it, nucleus comes, shoo, shut it down, and then it goes on. And you go about, about your, your day. But when caught it, nucleus malfunctions, which is like a lever uh, in, a, in a gear shift of a car that is supposed to automatically change gear from this speed to the other speed, and then, you know, downgrade the, the gear shift when the speed reduces. So caudate nucleus acts as a gear shift, automatic gear shift, to regulate, shut down, or open up, whatever, allow or not allow. But when the gear shift doesn't work automatically, you got to hold on to it and grab it and kind of manually direct it, encourage it, and put it in its gear. Same thing, when caudate nucleus is malfunctioning, is not going to shut down the intrusive thoughts that is not in line with your values. When it doesn't, then instead of you saying, oh, what was that? And then caught it, nucleus does its job, shuts down, and you go about your business. When it doesn't work as it's designed to do, the intrusive thought shows up, 
and you see it and it doesn't go away because carotid nucleus is malfunction and it hovers. Because it stays there, which is supposed to be disappearing, but it's now at a malfunction and signaling system is happening in the brain, then you think it must be true. Why did it not go away? Because you were not responsible to kick all these thoughts away when they're not appropriate to your standards. You are accustomed to it being done for you. Like people who are very wealthy and they have servants and maids and they do their work, butlers and all that, and, you know, uh, uh, help around the house or around their business. So they're used to that being done, those things to be done for them. And one day when they're not showing up or they're sick or some of these, uh, you know, uh, helpers are not showing up, the rich person is stuck, doesn't know what to do because never done it themselves. Same thing with you guys, with us all. Intrusive thought is always there, but carded nucleus shuts it off when it becomes apparent or intrusive that it comes to your attention, actually. It shuts it off. So you're used to it being done for you. But when it malfunctions and it's not doing what it's designed to do, carded nucleus, then these things pile up, hang in there. And you don't know what to do with it. And then you say, if it hasn't gone away, which always does, it means that's me then. I never knew that. I'm in denial. No, it just means that something's gone wrong in the system that was designed to function for you. You got to fix that. Not to believe the nonsense that is standing up there. You're supposed to now, like you did before in the gear shift example, guide your brain to rewire itself. In other words, grab onto the gear shift and move it into the shift that it's supposed to do. In other words, guide these thoughts to not to be taken into consideration. Guide the brain to learn you're not interested in creation of these thoughts. And they should simply not be produced rather than being produced and hoping that carded nucleus does its job and makes them disappear. You're now shortcutting the process by teaching the brain to not to produce it rather than being produced and being shut down by the apparatus, by the carded nucleus, the security system, the security guard, you know, the helper, that his job was this, clean out, clean out keep it balanced, keep it all the way my values are, keep the crowd away. So that's the process you should be focusing on, not that there is any merit to that suggestion. No, it's just that the sweeper is not there to get these things out of your way. Now you got to do it yourself. How? By recognizing them to be an intrusive thought, calling them for what it is, intrusive thought, OCD, HOCD, it's the brain, it's not me. Any of these, and then ignoring it and going about your business. That's how you teach the brain that when they show up, you don't pay attention to it. So you become very good at paying, not paying attention to it. In other words, synaptic neurons are being trained to create bridges for you being a very good operator for not paying attention to these things. Because the more you pay attention to them, the synaptic neurons create bridges based on what you're doing. So make you really good to pay attention to them. Like when you play piano, you play lots of piano, you practice a lot. Synaptic neurons create bridges to allow these neurotransmitters, these information pass through and to make you really good at playing piano. But when you don't play piano for a while, synaptic neurons are noticed that they're being dormant, not used, and microglial cells that have been are searching for these synaptic neuron bridges that are not working and they go and find these bridges that have been marked by CQ1 protein which indicates that they're not being worked destroy them microglial cells destroys them so they can be used for something else that you want to be good at so by not paying attention to these garbage and nonsense that is not in line with your values is made by the brain by not paying attention to them you're actually leaving the synaptic neurons that was paying attention to these things 
remain dormant, they'll be marked by CQ1, then they will be destroyed, and you release that attention and that training that you had given to the brain to pay attention. And you learn not to pay attention. And then not paying attention becomes your expertise and your default system. Before Carter Nucleus was doing it, now you bypass it all and you put the manual program in. Pretty much, roughly speaking, that's the scenario. So you need to constantly go through this exercise that Dr. Schwartz have explained to notice the intrusive thoughts, call it for what it is, and then ignore it and go by your business. And that rewires your brain to the way you want it to behave through neuroplasticity. Pretty much a rough way of explaining it in a short time. I can explain more if we ever have the one-on-one -on, -one on Skype in more detail. Uh, I love singing. It says, hello, 35 female United States. My question is, can you experience more than one type of OCD in your life? Meaning, if you experience one type for years, uh, then later, uh, for uh, type, for years, then, for years, then later, another type becomes present or forms. I hope that means, yes, it does make sense. Yes, of course you can. I have. I have experienced all kind of OCDs. <laughs> Living proof. Every OCD you can think of, I think I've had it. You know, I used to uh, go to school when, in elementary school uh, on bus. And I remember I would make this sound... Mm, 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 mm. and I would think it has to end at a certain note and I had to do it in order to make it feel like it's all balanced now okay it's done now it's, it's symmetric, it's balanced or however it made me feel, feel good the brain had this malfunction of thinking that I gotta do this otherwise something bad could happen for my parents or for something or my exam would not be good and then I had something else that I had to, you know, move my neck just because, I don't know, was it maybe it was because of horseback. Maybe I had a little bit of a muscle pain. I don't remember that one. But I had all kinds of things that I had to line up everything on the table. I had to wash my hands God knows how many times. I had to check the doorknob and make sure, I mean, check the door if it's locked. Check the stove 100 times before I leave. And um, then responsibility, I, I, I was hoping that nobody gets harmed because of my actions. So I got to make sure that I'll be, you know, um, be positive in the society or make sure that nobody as a result of any of my decisions or actions would come to harm. And all kind, HOCD, I had a visit with me as well. And, uh, but the thing is my brain was since childhood was very, very powerful. I don't know how, but it was. And then later on, I got into martial arts and Aikido and became even more powerful. So I had this uh, basis of belief and power about myself that it didn't matter what it was, I would just say, I handle it. And I never got fooled, even though the HOCD thoughts would make you feel as it's something but because your belief and your power of the brain you i looked at it as some kind of a weird malfunction not any doubt about anything but the fact of recognizing that this is weird and this is bad i don't like that and therefore that was the end of it that was the extent of it for me not to believe it was my fortune because I was powerful to not to give in to any suggestion but what I choose and what I know I am and that was the cornerstone of my power. So it never really was able to cause me anything because my belief was I am this and this is an enemy and it's attacking me but I'm just going to fight the hell out of it by not paying attention to it by recognizing it's so nasty 
images and all kind of things that would show up and it wouldn't go away was there forever. But for me, I only considered them as obnoxious, nasty, and disgusting, and no interpretation as it being any kind of a new me or a role in changing me or anything. I just recognized it for what it was, which was not in line with my values. And I was against it. So it had no chance to make any uh, problems for me, but I could clearly recognize this is a nasty thing that I hate. I do not agree with it. And that power didn't make it didn't make me I, I didn't need to go any further with it just recognizing that this is not cool that's it I don't agree with it that's it so I didn't need to do anything else I just simply could see the separation that that's something that I'm not but it's attacking and making me feel uncomfortable that was it and then eventually of course it, it went away because I simply got to know a lot more about how the brain works and then by this knowledge everything dissipated because the brain got rewired and understood the power in this entity is beyond its reach and suggestions will work. I guess it was something that I was blessed with, with childhood. in childhood. I remember I used to cry for something that, like, I don't know, I was scolded or something. I was a kid. So I was in front of the mirror. I still remember it. I was crying. And I said, right in the middle of my crying, I said, let's see if I can smile. Right in the middle of crying, that, and I said, let's see if I can smile. And I'd go like this in front of the mirror, and I'd say, oh, yeah, I can. Then I'd go back to crying. So I could actually challenge my control and power over my brain. So this was something that I always believed since childhood that I am the boss. I am in control despite of what the brain suggests, even at that childhood. So on that basis, when HOCD hit me, it was just like an enemy and I am the power. I don't accept or allow, but I can see the, the discrepancy and the fact that I'm not what it suggests, never want to be. And that is the way I handled it until later on I got a lot more information, education, which was very helpful. And to this day, that I research thoroughly for a long time now. So um, basically, that's perhaps what you need to focus on. Um, I love singing. Uh, girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're in the United States. Uh, United States is a big place. So I hope that's helpful to you. And Rice, Ross says, I've had HOCD, hypochondria OCD. Yeah. Like, like at the time, uh, uh, I love singing. Uh, I actually was worried about everything checking everything and worried about my health, worried about, oh, did I move my body wrong? So maybe I damaged it or something. So I had to reprogram myself. But the thing with me was I believed in myself that I can do it, that I am the master. I have a strong mind and I can change this. And sure enough, I did. It took me two years for all the other OCDs. And it was bad at one time. It was really, really bad and time consuming and frustrating and exhausting. But you know what? I never gave up and I fixed it all. And then you become a stronger person. The people who have OCD are usually above average intelligence. And when you go through that, any kind of OCD, and when you come out of it, having solved it, you become most powerful than you've ever been. And you will enjoy life more than ever with the knowledge and the wisdom and experience. And you become stronger and better than ever before. And that's what you should be looking for. So OCD sometimes, or any kind of it that hits you, it's in a way it's a blessing if you really treat it right and use that opportunity 
to elevate yourself to stronger power and a higher level of consciousness. And that gives you the power that you never thought you could have. As Obi-Wan said to Darth Vader, if you strike me, I will be more powerful than ever before. Something like that. <laughs> so if OCD or HOCD strikes you, you can go through it and you become more powerful than you ever thought you could ever be. All right. <clears throat> Guys, uh, in a few minutes, it's time for me to go. I've got an appointment I've got to attend to, so I apologize if it's short, but look, it was a pretty good session. Uh, I think we talked about things that uh, it's new and it will be helpful, hopefully. Sebastian says, hi, Mehran. I am 37 male, Toronto. Having experienced toxic woman, I am very hesitant to associate myself with mm, marriageable woman, marriageable woman due to fear of restricting myself, my personal growth and fear disguised in toxic woman. Well, listen, and then this is perhaps the last question I'm going to uh, elaborate on or maybe discuss. Sebastian says, can you offer advice for someone who wants a family that is worried he will be trapped by a misunderstood, misunderstood? feminist um, who in time will seek to destroy me and take my wealth and children? Excellent question. Excellent question. That's going to keep me here another hour, I guess. <laughs> Listen, it is not up to other people to give you salvation and save you or protect you or not to be harmful to you. There are many kind of people out there. Just as you said and you mentioned, there are people out there, women out there, who call themselves feminists when they don't actually know what feminism means. They think it means to be a man. But any of these isms are actually driving a person away from his or her actuality, speciality. Because you're taking some ism that was someone's motivation for some political reason, for some gaining power or gaining some kind of a favor or advantage, and now you're bringing it into you, which you actually don't know what, but you've heard it gives you a certain kind of an echelon or an image. But through that, you will forget about yourself and the cause, the ism, becomes more important to you than you yourself. You start following things that would affect your life and the effect of your loved ones, but it will not really mean anything to the quality of your life. In fact, destroys the quality of life that the history knows as a man and a woman want to have a family. And it has to be a certain kind of understanding, equality cooperation, collaboration, camaraderie, helping out, teamwork. But the ism, the feminism, for the, for the people who don't understand the real meaning and the concept in the, in the format that they're thinking about it, it's actually going to destroy all that that they are hoping to have. A strong family, strong presence, respect and all that. Women have always had respect, loved, protected, but these ism people brought this idea of feminism to them and the women thought, oh, I get more power. I get more pay for my work. I get more respect. As you can see, all of that gone away. You can hardly even now open a door for a woman because the fear of that you're going to disrespect her femininity or her power or presence. So you can't be getting up and offering your seat on a bus to a woman as we as a little boys learned to respect and give our space to older or younger someone older than us who is a woman and is standing and I'm sitting in a chair in the bus. We can't do that anymore because she might think I'm hitting on her. She might be disrespected. What do you think? I'm weak? 
Well, we are men. We are designed to protect you. And you want to take that protection away, and then you want to complain why the men are not behaving well, because you actually are training the men not to behave well, to look after themselves, not put you in front, because you are out to cut their necks. Why? You don't even know why. Because everything that you want in that relationship, in that family, protection, comfort, provisions, family, children, cohesiveness, teamwork, all of that is out to the window if you don't want to take up your role as a woman. And I don't care what you want to call it, equality and all that. Equality is very important and people should learn to be civilized and, 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 and treat each other with respect and love and equality. But you cannot deny that you're a woman and I'm a man and we are different. And that's the whole beauty of it. There are things in life that for the life of you, you cannot do it as good as I can do it. And there are things in life that for the life of me, I cannot do it as good as you can do it. Women can do certain things far better than a man. And men there can do certain things far better than a woman. Women can never do it as good as them and men can never do it as good as them, depending on what the topic is. If it's sciences and so on and mental things, pretty much equal. If it's about protection or, I don't know, lifting weights or doing certain sports, the best of the woman cannot compete with the best of the man in that particular event or sport or whatnot. You cannot tell me that, no, we are equal. Well, we're equal in rights and choices. But we are not equal in our presence, in our abilities, physical abilities specifically, and in our role in life. You can have children. I cannot have children. You cannot expect to be a man because I, that wouldn't attract me. If I want to have a wife, I want a wife that wants to be a wife, want to be proud to be a woman, feminine, beautiful, take care of herself. All those emotions, all those center, all those warmth that a woman can only, and only a woman can bring to a family. You're taking that away and then you still want to have a family. Why would anyone want to have a family with a woman who's not proud to be a woman, doesn't want to be a woman, doesn't act like a woman, wants to be rough and tough, and doesn't take care of herself as a woman should, and doesn't have that emotional balance that only a woman can bring to the universe? Why? You know, I don't, I don't want to date myself. It's just not normal for me. So if you want to have the kind of life that you expect, with the comfort and security and love and all the things that you've grown up to have as a woman, then you've got to continue having your role as a woman. You can't relinquish that role but still have a family and have that kind of a whole wholesome environment that our fathers had and the beauty and the whole sense of responsibility to your wife and the expectation that she has, the encouragement that she puts in because she's a woman. And you try to, 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 to comply to her expectations. A mother in the family is so important. Woman is so important and respectable. And these isms have taken all that away and haven't replaced it with anything of value. Nothing. It's all bullshit. Why? Because they have tricked women to think that they're gaining something with this ism where everything else that they actually valued is gone because they sold them a bill that you, be a man, you're going to be a better woman when you're not a woman. The whole beauty of the world is centered around women. And they're taking that away and they're taking the protection of women by men away so then they can dominate the woman because there's no more protection for them. They can use them even. This is the plan. And women are being fooled by constantly believing that, oh, I'm going to be a feminist. What does that mean? Do men say, I want to be a meninist? We are men, we are women. Women and men. Why is there supposed to be ism in there? You are who you are. 
a woman becomes more woman when she is not a woman and she has joined a group called feminism? What does that mean? I don't understand what feminism really means, other than the fact that we all agree and adhere to the importance of equality, respect, protection of all, including women, children, anybody, yeah? And respect for women. And we had all that. So what did women really gain by this business of feminism? Equality? Definitely. Must be. It doesn't have to be belong to an ism to have equality. Equality is a must for every man or woman, child, anybody. Yeah? But equality in opportunity. But you cannot have equality of outcome just because you want it to be. You can't get the same pay if you're not as expert as the person next to you, whether it's a woman or a man. I don't care. Even women are not getting the same pay for the same job that they're doing because of their expertise and level of understanding or education or experience gives them a different echelons of pay grade. But feminists supposedly say, if I understand it right, that uh, they want to be able to not do the same quality of a job as other women or other men, but they still get paid as much as the woman who does a great job or expert in that or the man who is an expert in that. What kind of expectation is that? That's not equality. That's kind of uh, being favored for the fact that you want to be because you say you're a woman and then you should have these things. No. What about qualification? If you're qualified for it, why not? But there are certain things that you cannot be as qualified as a man is, as man as men are not cannot be in certain things as qualified as a woman could be. So I really don't understand in what tangent these feminists or feminism is helping the world, other than having taken all the beauty and respect and important echelon that the woman has in this life, in every single one of our lives, is taken away from you guys. So you need to open your eyes and see what your values are. What are you looking in a woman? If you're looking for her beauty and sexuality, she's going to use that to drive you to, to gutter. If she's a feminist and wants to use her feminism or sexuality in order to control you, you got to open your eyes and see what kind of a woman is this woman. Is she a woman? Or is she a woman who doesn't want to be a woman, wants to be a feminist, which is being a man, pretty much, in certain ways? Or is she having her interpretation of feminism is that she wants to have equal opportunities? Well, that's everyone's right, that's for sure. Definitely. So you got to open up your eyes and learn by the courtship time, what is this woman like? What is her intention? And don't be fooled by the fact that she's beautiful and she's got a nice body and you can't do without her. Yeah, you can. Because you cannot have relationship with pretty. You cannot have relationship with just her sexuality. The relationship comes between your consciousnesses. How you bond unconsciously. And that comes with understanding and learning about each other through time. And through that time, courtship, you will learn who she is, what she's all about. You're not supposed to just only look at her beauty and then be dazzled by it and think, oh, well, she's a female, therefore she's perfect, she's a woman. No, not every female is a woman. The mentality, the attitude, the interaction, the interest, the intention, that makes a woman. The consciousness, taking up her role in a family, that's what's needed for a balanced family. So if she doesn't want to be, she's not proud of that, she doesn't want to be the woman that attracts men to that quality of a woman, then that won't work. And you will find that out through your interaction with her through the courtship time. And don't give in just because she's pretty and you just like the sex. Because that same thing that you like, if she's the kind of woman that she you think she is, that you are not interested in, the diehard feminist who really doesn't know why she's actually being feminist, She's a feminine. Everybody loves her. She's a woman. So what's more than being a woman? Feminist. What, what, why do you have to be feminist? You're a feminine. You're a woman. I have to be womanist. What does that mean? Hmm? 
something you feel you're not and you want to compensate, why? You're actually taken away from your whole feminist, feminism. The whole feminism you're taking it away by becoming a feminist because it makes you not really that person who can take on the leadership of a family, the nucleus of a family, how it operates, the energy that you have. The difference in that energy is what makes the family work. You take that energy away from yourself, then everything goes lopsided. And it never has worked. No family is really happy when the woman is not a woman and not taking care of herself in the way that her speciality is and taking that role and her responsibilities and wants to be something other than that. And what if the man is supposed to say, okay, and I'm a manist, meaning I just don't care about anything and just do my own thing. And what's that? That's again wrong too. So open your eyes and see what your values are and then, um, then fit in the values that you're looking for if that woman has those values and she's proud and happy to be a woman rather than wanting to bring a certain political cause into her life and have other people design what she should be or how she should be acting other than what nature has designed her to be to have the family that she wants to have and do her due diligence and do her uh, responsibilities, take care of what she's best at. You know, a man cannot feed a child uh, through, you know, milking the child through his body, cannot give birth. And these are the things that no man can ever do nearly uh, as good and as the woman can do. So there is a respect for each role and you want to take that away, change that and then say, I'm still uh, going to be accepted and you should still love me. Why? Love you for what? I'm tough and rough myself. I don't, you know, I want someone sweet and amazing and emotional and, you know, that what brings the balance. So anyhow, so you don't compromise your values. See if she has the values you're looking for. And through time, you can be sure if she is. But remember, not all women are like you're explaining. There are amazing women in this world still there who love to be women, take care of themselves, responsible and educated and capable, and they can accomplish anything in life. They're tough and they're strong and they're, you know, um, raising their families right. They're focused on that. And they take themselves seriously and they're still beautiful and feminine and sweet and loving and encouraging and powerhouse of the center nucleus of that family. And everything goes around in that family because they're there. That's the value of the woman that you should be looking for. And there are women like that around the world and becoming more and more because everybody's recognizing this feminism bullshit is not going to sustain is not going to bring a better quality in families it's just going to separate things you know separate it's going to just make things not harmonious because the world needs women the way they have been designed that's what brings balance not women deviating from their special and important powerful role that the world needs them to be anyhow so open your eyes and stick with your values and choose and select the way you should be. <clears throat> and don't judge all women in the same way. They're not all the same. They're just amazing women still available. Just look harder. Look harder. All right. I told you that's going to take a while and still wasn't finished now. Hi, Mehran. I have been here in a while. I feel like as the weather gets nicer, less people join Live Shine. Yeah, I know, but that's okay. Popo is 32 female, Baltimore. Oh, okay. And she says, I get anxious and paranoid easily if a friend doesn't text me right back. I reread the message to make sure I didn't offend her. <laughs> 
when I speak to customer service, since most of them are working from home, I get nervous, my personal info leaking. When I go to doctor's office, I get paranoid if the office staff who are my age in 30s would look at my medical history and judge judge me and maybe have mutual friends. I try to stop these ruminating thoughts. Now, look, you really don't have to worry about all this information. And to make it easy for you, all the information that every one of us is accessible to uh, any authority who wants to find it. So trying, trying to worry about it is really futile. It's not something that <clears throat> if you think they could be looking at it, then they will be looking at it. No. They've got better things to do. What do they want to know about, you know, what your, uh, you know, blood works uh, results were? So what? Okay, yeah, your cholesterol is this or what? Or you had this infection or what? So what does it do to them? They have the same infection. You think they're perfect? You think these people that might be looking at your records are actually flawless? Nobody is. So the fact is that you think others are better than you is your fear that you'll be judged. But when you recognize that they're no better than you, they have their, some other problems that you don't have. And they wish they had your problems, in fact. Who knows? Then you will rest assured that, hey, we're all fine. No big deal. Nobody has an advantage over the other one. Everybody has something going on in their lives and some challenges. So don't judge yourself based on what you perceive other people are because you don't know their actuality. So leave it at that. They want to look at your records or be my guest. Go fuck yourselves. Keep looking at my records. So what does that do? What does that get you? What does that get them if they keep looking at your record? They know about it. Okay, so what? Nothing happens, yeah? Your information is there. You're, okay, so gets out. So who? Is it going to have a billboard? You come out of your, you see on all, on, you see on all buses that says, oh, so-and-so, popo, uh, you know, blood work, uh, hemoglobin level is this. So whatever. Or she had a vaginal infection. Or oh, okay. Or she had this and that. Or she's, her, you know, blood pressure is this. So big fucking deal. Don't occupy yourself with nonsense, with things that are irrelevant. They don't have any effect on your life or anybody else's life. Just let all these bullshit go. Focus on things that brings you enjoyment, brings you enjoyment, happiness, balance, fulfill your goals, uh, work toward your accomplishing what you set out to accomplish. Things that really matter, you should pay attention to. Things don't matter just because they're there come to your mind doesn't mean they should now matter because they came to your mind. No, you're supposed to be the judge of what comes to your mind to decide if it should matter or not matter. Because there's so many things, 80, 90,000 thoughts a day come to your mind. But if you just want to pay attention to all of them, you're going to waste your life. Anyhow, that's as much as I can go for it today, Popo. Maybe next time we'll talk a little bit more. I got to go. I've got an appointment. I don't want to be late. So... It's time for me to say I love you all. Thank you very much for being here and sharing a thing or two with me and allowing me to share a thing or two with you. I look forward to talking to you. Maybe tonight at 9 o'clock I'll have another live stream depending on how, I, uh, you know, how my time goes. But usually on Saturdays we have two live streams, but I'm not sure. Usually uh, lately I haven't been doing the night ones. If I'm in the mood, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll look forward to talk to you guys, to see you guys next week, Saturday at 1 o'clock. In the meantime, be good to yourself, to the others. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.